Wonderful. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we're talking all about fossils with our scientist, Sarah Sheffield. Um, just as a heads up, we are running these about once a day, Monday through Friday-ish, um, during this uh, delightful quarantine time that we're all in. Um, so our program is a nonprofit. If you're not familiar with us, generally we match up scientists with classrooms and other groups to chat about science and generally make science accessible for as many people as possible and make people feel as welcome in science as we can. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit and if you are able to support us, um, we really, really appreciate it. It would help us so much during this time. You can support us via uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or uh, at PayPal for a one-time donation. That's paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. All of those donations are tax deductible. Um, so at this point, Sarah, I'm gonna have you take it away. All right. So hi, everybody. Um, so first, I'm gonna introduce myself uh, both in English and in ASL. So my name is Sarah Sheffield, and I would like to start by thanking our interpreter, Erin. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I invited a whole bunch of uh, my deaf colleagues and friends, so hopefully some of them are watching and I'm really excited. All right, so I'm a paleontologist and I'm so excited to be here today. First, this is the first human interaction I've had in about a week, so I'm real sorry if I'm really excited, but haven't talked to anybody in a long time outside my house. So um, I work at the University of South Florida in Tampa. And there I am an assistant professor, which means I do research in fossils and I teach classes all about fossils and I love it so much. And I do lots of outreach things like this. So I worked with Skype as scientist for quite a few years. I've probably worked with about 10 classrooms so far. So a lot of you, when you hear the word paleontologist, you're thinking dinosaur, right? We all know what you're thinking dinosaurs, but I'm going to tell you there's way better fossils out there, way better fossils. And the fossils I study are things that look like this. This is a brittle star related to our starfish. Maybe you recognize that five ish shape. And that was found in Morocco. All right, Morocco is in the northern part of Africa. And that fossil is 400 million years old. Now, where do starfish live? They live in the ocean, right? So this was found in the mountains. What do you think that means about Morocco? Well, at one point in time, 400 million years ago, Morocco was underwater, just like a lot of the United States was, a lot of the world was, a lot of Africa, Europe, South America was underwater during that time. So this is gonna be in a time called the Ordovician. We don't need to worry about names or anything. All you need to know that it was a really long time ago and the world was absolute chaos at this time. And what that means is it was super, super, super hot, which made all of our glaciers melt. And when they melted, our sea levels rose like crazy to the point where Tennessee was underwater, to the point where Kansas was underwater. Almost the entire world was underwater. And that was a really great time for things like our good old friend, the echinoderms. And echinoderm is the fancy word for things that are, uh, things that are like starfish, brittle stars, sea urchins, things like that. But I study stuff that existed long before brittle stars and starfish. So really fast, I wanna tell you a little bit about echinoderm. So I'm gonna screen share with you. So my face is gonna disappear for a sec. All right. Oh, nope, I cannot uh, screen share just yet. It says it's disabled. So instead, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this before we do the screen sharing. And I'm gonna show you some other things that live during this time. Here are things related to the modern day squid. So Sarah, I thought you would like this. I do love These are that. called straight shelled cephalopods. And cephalopod is C-E-P-H for those of you trying to spell these wacky words at home. So those are straight shelled cephalopods and they swam kind of like this back and forth in the ocean. Here we have a coral. This is an ancient coral. Do you see all the little lines there? Those are individual critters living in one large colony. And corals today, they live in warm water, right? They love warm water, tropical environments. 
This is a fossil I found from Southern Indiana. Now is Southern Indiana a warm tropical place today? Absolutely not, right? No, I live in Florida and I'm gonna say that no, I would never visit there in the winter time, okay? So this used to be, Indiana used to be incredibly close to the equator when our ocean levels were really high. So a long, long, long time ago, Indiana would have been a really great tropical destination. Not so much today. All right, and I'm gonna show you this last ooh, amazing fossil. It weighs a lot. This is also related to the modern squid. This is a mollusk and it is extremely heavy and it's an ammonite. The biggest ammonites are actually larger than humans. You can find them in Texas. But this is massive, right? It weighs about 15 or so pounds. I've dropped it many times on my foot. But yeah, you can see all the little lines across it. That's actually how it's controlling the amount of water in its body, so how it can float up and down in the column, which is pretty great. So why do I study paleontology? One of the things I study, I'm here, and now that I can screen share, I'm gonna show you some of these fossils. All right, there we go. Share, hopefully everybody can see this. Excellent, okay, so this is a starfish fossil. It's gorgeous, right? I know you all are nodding your heads, excellent. So for those of you watching, how many pieces to a starfish do you think there are? I'll have Sarah take a guess because she's the only person who can hear me. Sarah, shout out a number. How many pieces are there? There's over a million pieces to one starfish, just one. There's a million pieces. For reference, you have 206 bones up to 210, depending on if you're a baby and you're watching this, but there's 206 bones in the human body. A starfish has a million. So as you can imagine, fossils, if they're million pieces, you may not find them super often. So this is an incredibly gorgeous fossil. So real quick, this is what I study. This is an echinoderm. It's not an alien, I promise, okay? So this is an echinoderm from Indiana called polycystis. Don't worry too much about spelling, all right? So polycystis was found 375, 400 million years ago or so. And how it works is it has five things on top of its body that look like a starfish. And they have arms that go in the air and weave around a little bit. And little pieces of nutrients come down into the mouth. And that's what they look like. Here's the top. So you can see that one, two, three, four, five there on the uh, picture on the right. That's where the food would go in. And do you see the big hole below that fifth thing? That is the butt, all right? So echinoderms have really cool systems for eating food and getting rid of food and things like that. But this is what they look like. And I study them because echinoderms are really picky creatures, okay? They're super picky. So when water gets too warm, they pack up their bags and they run to places where the water's a little bit cooler. When the earth gets too cold, they pack up their bags and they move to a place where it's a little bit warmer. So during the Ordovician, remember how I said sea levels were really, really, really high? That means whenever it got too warm for them, they would actually move and they would evolve in different ways to try and avoid all of that weather or that climate, excuse me. So when I study the Ordovician, what I'm actually studying is how animals responded to climate change. Climate change has been happening since the earth began, right? So it gets warmer, colder, okay? That doesn't mean that climate change today isn't something we shouldn't care about because climate change today is greatly influenced by human activity. But climate change has been going on for an extremely long time. And I'm just gonna show you really quickly these fossils. These are my photos and my fossils. So I just wanted to show you them because they're beautiful. This is a fossil called Eumorphosystis. E-U-M-O-R-P-H-O-C-Y-S-T-I-S, for those of you trying to spell at home, all right? And this is, really quickly, one of the coolest things about echinoderms. So you see, that's a snail on the top right corner on top of an echinoderm called a crinoid, C-R-I-N-O-I-D. And this snail isn't just best friends with this crinoid. This is really gross and awesome. The snail here really likes eating poo, okay? So the snail has actually has a little drill. A lot of snails have a little drill, okay? It's uh, kind of like their teeth. So it's called a radula, all right? And it's drilling into the echinoderm or the crinoid's body to actually get the poo out so we can eat it, right? 
And the echinoderms like, uh, what am I supposed to do, right? So they actually live like that. Pretty cool, right? We find this in the fossil record all the time. This snail loved it. All right, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing here. And nope, not new share. I am not sure how to end, pause share. There we go, okay, stop. There we go, okay, I'm back. All right, so I think I have told you everything I wanna tell you about uh, uh, my life and things like that. So if you would like to tell me things or ask me questions, I'm so happy to answer them. All right, let's do it. Okay, so the first question, what do you like most about your job? Oh my gosh, what do I like most? Okay, first off, I have the coolest job in the entire world. So I get to study fossils and play with them. So it's pretty great. So um, my favorite part about my job uh, is the fact that I get to teach. So I teach classes of up to 200 students and I teach a lot of intro classes, which means I have business majors, I have English majors, history majors who are like, I'm not gonna like this class. So I find it the greatest challenge on earth to walk in there and say, by the end of this class, all of you will love science. So I absolutely love teaching. It is my very favorite. I know I've got some students listening in right now. So hopefully, you know, I'm talking about all of you, but my students are the best part about my job. All right, next. Um, do you personally dig the fossils out of the ground? Yes, not all the time, but I have in the past. So my science comes from two different places. One, I work in museums. So I look at collections that other people have built so that I can study. And two, I go out into the field all over the world to look for fossils. For example, I've been to Spain to look for fossils. I've been to Argentina. I have been to Sardinia, which is a small island uh, off of Italy. So all of these places have been unexplored for fossils for the large part. So we go there and try to figure out what fossils were actually there. So Morocco is one of those places. Morocco has tons of fossils that are being discovered right now as we speak. I have colleagues there right now looking for, well, they just left, but they were looking for fossils. So all of these fossils are almost brand new to the world, which is really great. All right, what is the oldest fossil you've ever worked with? Ooh, that's a great question. So the oldest fossil I have ever worked with has been from a time called the Cambrian, C-A-M-B-R-I-A-N, the Cambrian. And that is up to about 540 million years old. So it is super, super old. And I tell you, when you get to hold something that old, it is absolutely magnificent. All right, uh, how do you know where to look for fossils? That's a really great question. So there are some clues we can look for to help us figure it out. So there's three types of rocks, okay? Three types of rocks, sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. Igneous rocks are made from volcanics, right? So they're lava and magma that have cooled over time. Those aren't gonna be great for finding fossils. As you can imagine, doesn't preserve bones very well. Metamorphic rocks are made from heating and pressuring a lot of igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks. So they destroy fossils too. So we're looking for sedimentary rocks. So first we go for sedimentary rocks. Then we look for rocks that are the correct age. If I'm looking for dinosaurs, I'm not gonna go back to 500 million years ago because dinosaurs weren't there. I'm gonna go back to 70 million years ago where I know T-Rex was happy and loving life in Montana, all right? So those are the two main things we look for. Sometimes we'll go on a trip and we'll find nothing. Um, I've spent two weeks in Montana and we only found stuff on day 14. So those days can be kind of sad, but when you find those fossils, it makes it worth it. Have you ever personally found dinosaur fossils? I have. So I don't have any with me because um, paleontologists really aren't supposed to keep the fossils they find, especially vertebrate fossils, which are very rare. But I have found a Triceratops rib. So Triceratops is the dinosaur with the three horns up here. So I found a piece of rib about that big. And I was so excited, I screamed and almost threw it. So That's don't, do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. So like, 
what's the oldest fossil any scientist has ever found? Ooh, so we believe, or we uh, have found evidence for life to have evolved about a little bit over 3 billion years ago. And the fossils that we have from that aren't what you would think. They're, uh, they're essentially chemicals found in rocks that are organic, meaning made of living stuff. So the first thing that we recognize as a fossil are gonna be things like bacteria, all right? So it kind of looks like little noodles left in a rock, like noodle shapes, quite literally spaghetti, okay? And that's from about two and a half billion years ago. Those are the first what we call body fossils, the fossil of a body. And that's in uh, opposite of something, a trace fossil. So if you left a footprint in the sand, I won't know who made that footprint, but I will know a human was there. That's a trace fossil. So I've got a trace fossil right here, actually. This is a worm burrow. So the worm is gone, but this is the burrow left behind, which is so cool. I found this fossil in Tennessee, and it may not be the shiniest or prettiest of fossils, but it's really cool. A worm lived 400 million years ago and left a burrow. That's super cool. How mm -hmm. do fossils form? That is an excellent question. So there's a whole bunch of different ways and I've got some great examples here. So, oof, this is heavy. Do you see this beautiful hunk of rock right here? Do you see all the beautiful colors? If you look closely, what does this look like? Looks like tree bark, doesn't it? That's what it is, it's a tree. So this is petrified wood, all right? It's found out in Arizona a lot of the times in the United States, it's a really common place to find it. But fossils can be made in a whole bunch of ways. So first, the best way is to not have any soft or have a lot of hard part instead of soft parts. So if you have bones, teeth, you have a shell, you're gonna be way better off of fossilizing. No offense to squids, but they're not the greatest fossils, right? Jellyfish, not gonna be the best fossils. But things like, oof, this ammonite here, this is all shell. It would have soft parts coming out here, kind of like a squid would look today with all the tentacles. All right. But that never really, really, very rarely preserves. So one of the ways that we can do it is we bury things quickly in the ocean. We can bury it with mud and that protects it from being messed up or from other things coming in saying, ooh, delicious, soft parts. Let me eat that. So that's one way. Another way is this petrified wood. This was formed by silica, rich fluids coming in and actually covering this tree and actually turning it into rock over time. So silica is the main ingredient in things like quartz. Quartz are like the pebbles you see a lot of the times on the side of the road. Uh, rose quartz, amethyst, that's all the same thing. It's pretty much what's making up the structure of this petrified wood, which preserves it over time. So those are a bunch of main ways. There's a whole bunch of other things, but I won't keep going on that. Uh, when did you know you wanted to become a paleontologist and how did you get to where you are now? So that's a great question. So um, I went to the University of North Carolina. I'm a huge basketball fan and I'm still crying about March Madness, but it's okay. All right, it was a great, uh, great decision. So I went to UNC Chapel Hill so that I could be a music teacher. I played the flute and I was in a bagpipe band all through high school and I loved music and I wanted to be a music educator. I wanted to perform. I wanted to be a marching band director specifically. I love marching band. Okay. So I got to UNC and I took my first music lesson and the professor was like, you're pretty good, but you probably need to practice four or five hours a day. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. That sounds terrible. And I was all of a sudden like, okay, Music, I love it, but it's not my life passion. I love it as a hobby, but it's not what I want to do. So then I was like, okay, well, I have no plan. Here I am at college. I have no idea what I want to do. And so I sign up for a random class called Prehistoric Life. And I was like, you know, I liked science in high school, but I don't know, let's try it out. And the first day of class, there was this old man behind the podium, and he was just talking these beautiful stories about dinosaurs and these fossils I had never heard of. And I was just completely blown away with how like magical and poetic everything was. So I switched my major that day to be a geologist and decided I had to do it. I had to be a paleontologist and I was gonna teach paleontology someday. So there you go. Take That's random awesome. classes. It can only uh, help you figure out what you wanna do with life. 
Cool. Um, how do fossils get into a museum and have any of the fossils that you've personally found and uh, ended up in museum collections? Absolutely. So paleontologists have like a code of honor, okay? Uh, and that is when you find fossils, you have to put it in a museum. So if you publish or write a paper on a fossil, that fossil has to be put somewhere where other people can use it, right? So if I find a T-Rex and then keep it in my house, other scientists can't get to it. So that's not cool, right? That's illegal, actually, in paleontology. We have very strict rules about it. There's like a 60-page rule book about it. I'm not joking. It's not the best book you've ever read in your life. Very boring. So um, the fossils you find, if you're going to publish them, if you think they're good fossils and tell us a lot, and every fossil is a good fossil, you put it in a museum collection. So I do have fossils that have been put in museum collections. Uh, the Cincinnati Museum Center has some of my fossils, and other museums will have them too. Um, a lot of the fossils I study have come from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., Yale Peabody Museum up in Connecticut, both in the United States. The Estonia Museum, a geological museum in Tallinn, Estonia, has a lot of the fossils I use. But absolutely, museums are the greatest treasure to humans in terms of paleontology. So I know there are a lot of squid fossils that um, are like super common, like these little ammonites, and you'll see them being sold at rock shops and that kind of thing. Should we feel okay about having uh, yeah. fossils like that? Yeah, so again, I've got this one right here. So this is called, uh, this is a type of fossil. The name of it is Orthocaris, C-E-R-A-S. And uh, they're so, so common. They're beautiful fossils and they have such deep meaning because when you're holding it, you're holding a piece of Earth's history, which is wonderful, but um, they're extremely common. So it's okay. If you were to buy a T-Rex skeleton, we've only got like eight partial skeletons in the entire world. So I would ask you please not to, all right? So how many fossils do you personally own? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I am a geologist and I'm married to a geologist. So whenever we move, um, no one ever wants to help us move. I'll just say that. No one. Okay. They're just like, no, we know how many rocks you have. So um, I do have a lot of fossils um, from field trips and things like that. So I probably have a couple hundred, but none of them are museum quality. Any that I found for research purposes go to a museum. I don't keep any specimens, any fossils that, um, should uh, be put in a museum. Um, are fossils super delicate? They can be. They can absolutely be super delicate. Um, in the long term, all fossils are very delicate. Think about it this way. Uh, this fossil was formed hundreds of millions of years ago when it's been buried for so long. So over time, even just having it in my house, it will decay. It will break down over time, all right? So as it breaks down over time, it would take, this would take a couple million years to break down. So don't worry, I won't see it happen and neither will anybody else, right, here. So it's gonna be a long time down that road. Um, so, excuse me, I completely lost my train of thought for a second. But some fossils, this is a pretty sturdy one, right? I could drop it and it probably wouldn't break, though I'm not gonna test that hypothesis now. Uh, but some of them are quite delicate, so bones especially can break down over time. So we keep fossils in rooms with very specific temperatures, very uh, cons uh, consistent humidity levels, things like that. It's a great question. Cool. How do you think paleontology will change in the future? That's a really great question. So paleontology has changed so much just in the past 20 years, okay? So in the past 20 years or so, we have changed. We have more women involved in paleontology. We have more people of color, more people with disabilities. So a lot of people, when you think of paleontology, we think of somebody running out into the mountains for days at a time with a big beard and a fossil or in a hammer or something like that to go break open rocks. And that's changing, right? As you can imagine, people with physical disabilities may not be able to go out into the field like that. So for example, I've been uh, unable to go out into the field for a year and a half because I hurt my ankle. So I couldn't do any field work. But luckily, we've started doing more things like um, we use fossils in the museum collections. We can do new tests. So things that were unimaginable 20 years ago, we can do now. 
So did you know that we can actually start knowing the colors of dinosaurs? We can get teeny tiny little chemical things that have been preserved for 70 million years, 100 million years, and actually figure out the colors of dinosaurs. So soon, we actually might be able to say, no, we really do know that. So new technologies have developed all over the place. That is a great question. Awesome. Um, about how long does it take a fossil to form? That is also another great question. So the definition, and there is a definition of a fossil, okay? And that's about something that's 10,000 years old. So we say 10,000 years old, and it's not like we celebrate the birthday of something that's 9,999 years old and say, congratulations, you're now a fossil. It's an estimate, okay? So things that are about 10,000 years old will start to undergo chemical changes. And once those chemical changes start happening, once something starts becoming a rock, uh, so these things will be transferred to rock over time, more solid, that's when we call it a fossil. Cool. Um, have you ever found a, a fossil that, like a type of fossil that nobody else has ever found? That's a great question. So yes. Now these would not be the kinds that you would hear about on the news, mostly because you only hear about dinosaurs, right? Um, so uh, I have found fossils. They are echinoderms. So again, those uh, things that look a lot like starfish for those of you just joining us. Um, and uh, they have had really weird features. So some of them have had arms where we didn't think that they would have arms. And again, these arms are kind of hanging up and going in the air, all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, I have found fossils like that and they are really cool and important to the science community. So hopefully you follow some cool paleontologists on Twitter, something like that, so you can learn about some of these. Awesome. Um, how do you know how old a fossil is once you find it? Good question. So this is a team effort. So understanding the age of rocks is something that takes a whole lot of time. All right, it takes quite a few different people. So we have geologists who study dates of rocks. So a lot of the times we have different elements in a rock that are preserved and we can get those dates because when they're made, they like take a snapshot. It's almost like looking at a calendar from a hundred million years ago. So there's lots of ways like that. Second is if I'm a paleontologist, I know when certain uh, animals lived. I know when T-Rex lived. So if I find a T-Rex fossil, I know where I am in the geologic time scale. If I find a fish fossil, I have a better idea of where I am. Or if I find something like um, that petrified wood I just showed you, the big tree fossil. There we go. I know a little bit about what time period I'm in because I know what type of tree this is. So there's a lot of different ways and we all have to work together to kind of make one big answer because the geologic time scale is kind of like a puzzle. Um, bring up that wood again. How did that uh, petrified wood get so colorful? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so imagine with me that you have a cake, okay? So you're making a vanilla cake. So quartz is the mineral we're talking about right now, quartz, which is SiO2, silicon dioxide, okay? And this is gonna get a lot more fun in a second when we go back to the cake. So silicon dioxide has a lot of room in it for chemical impurities. So amethyst, does everybody, can you picture amethyst a little bit? It's that purple mineral that you see a lot of the times. It's that really pretty purple rock. And that is purple because of a chemical impurity in it, okay? So that chemical impurity turns it a weird color. So if you're baking a cake, and let's say you accidentally knock in some green, well, it's gonna turn your cake green, right? You accidentally knock in some purple with that green, now it's gonna be kind of like a weird brownish purple green. So when we knock in chemical impurities, that's when it causes lots of color changes. Quartz is really good at holding these impurities. Some minerals aren't some minerals are. So quartz has a rainbow of colors to it, which is why petrified wood often looks so beautiful and rainbowy. Awesome, thanks. Um, what kind of team are you working with? Like who, who's on your team? How big is your team? And how do you work together? So I am a brand new faculty member or professor, excuse me, at University of South Florida. I've been there about three years, but I've been a professor for about one year. So I was teaching before that, okay? 
So um, my team right now is mostly made up of uh, colleagues and friends that I've met along the way. So I work with a group of women across the United States right now, and we write papers together about all kinds of stuff. I have a brand new graduate student coming in in the fall, so he'll be added to my team. Uh, his name is Steven, so if you're watching, hi Steven, glad to have you. Uh, and I work with a lot of other professors. So my team is quite large and that's the best way to do science is to have people from all over because you know what you know, but other people know different stuff. So the more people you work with, the more knowledge you can bring to the table. Awesome. Um, so as a paleontologist, do you get to decide what kind of animals that you work on or is it just whatever you find out in the field? So that depends. So you can go and work with certain fossils, but you can also work with certain questions. Like, I want to understand how things are related to each other. So for example, how, um, how, what are the evolutionary relationships of things? So you could answer that question by using tons of different animals, same question, but you could also answer all the kinds of questions about echinoderms you ever wanted to know. Me? I love echinoderms. I'm pretty set on them. They are my one true love, science-wise, okay? So I answer questions like, how did echinoderms grow? Or how did they move across ocean basins a long, long, long time ago? So all kinds of stuff. Awesome. How much time do you spend looking at any one fossil? A lot, a lot, a lot. So that can depend on what type of question you're looking for. But I have fossils that I have spent days, literally hours and hours and hours, like 40 hours staring at this one little itty bitty fossil, trying to figure out what is going on with it. Some of them are really easy to tell. You're like, oh, yep, I know what that is. And then the next one is, ooh, I have no idea what's going on. And that can take a lot longer. It's cool. a great question. Um, in the United States, where <laughs> is the most fossil rich area? Okay, so there's a whole bunch, but I'm going to tell you about my favorite places. So Florida has a lot of fossils, but Florida is the baby of the United States. Not politically or historically, but geologically, we're the baby, okay? So Florida is like eh, 60 million years old at the oldest. So Florida doesn't have the cool fossils that I love, and I'm so sorry for Florida geologists watching this, okay? But the great fossils from 400 million years ago, from when oh, the world was underwater pretty much, are in Kentucky and Ohio and West Virginia. And that's where you can find just absolutely magnificent fossils. There are places where you can just find them raining out of the uh, side of the road. You can just pick up a whole bunch and walk away. It's magical. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That makes me really want to go to West Virginia. Um, yeah. So do you prefer being out in the field or working in the lab? That depends. I do like field work. I really do. Um, but it's not my favorite. I think I work in the lab a lot. I like, I like working in the lab because I have more opportunities to work with other people and collaborate and things like that. But going out for field work is really fun. You can go out for a couple of days, you get to roll around in the dirt and play and you know, um, it's always a pain when I get back because there's constantly fossils in my washing machine. So, you know, both are really that happens. Fun. What? Hate it when that happens. Hate it when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned that you can tell what color a dinosaur may have been from the chemicals mm -hmm. in the fossil. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how you figure that out? Yes. So certain chemical or certain colors have certain chemical signatures. Okay. And we can tell because of birds today. So we have birds alive today. They're everywhere and birds have gorgeous colors. So we actually can tell what chemical signatures could have made red or green. Now, a lot of us know uh, that dinosaurs had feathers. A lot of dinosaurs had feathers. So we think back to Jurassic Park and we're like, hmm, okay, T-Rex was scary, but what if we cover it in feathers? And now we know that T-Rex likely had feathers. That doesn't mean you should be less afraid of it. So if you've ever come across an emu, mm -mm. They're alive and they're mean, okay? So don't think T-Rex is less terrifying because they have feathers. So uh, we can find the same compounds, the same chemicals from birds that were red and green and brown that we can find in dinosaurs. Those fossils are rare, 
but we can still find them, which is really incredible. So we can start to figure out what colors dinosaurs were. A lot of them were brownish. They were kind of a dull colored, but other dinosaurs were probably gonna start to see maybe had flashy feathers like peacocks today or cardinals. So yeah. Awesome. Um, what type of tools do paleontologists use and uh, what's like the latest technology in uh, finding fossils? Awesome. So there's a bunch of different things. So my favorite tool if I'm going out into the field is a hammer. Uh, just a good old hammer. It breaks up rocks for you. It is the best. Okay, so that is the easiest tool and you can just go ahead and get that at a home improvement store very easily. Um, for finding fossils, we have a bunch of new technologies. So there's a lot of new mapping technology. Okay, so we can use maps to predict where we think fossils might find. So even Google Earth and things like that, we can actually look and say, ooh, I wonder if that place might have fossils, okay? Or we can use drones. So the robots that kind of fly over, for those of you who don't know what a drone is, all right? Um, and we can start to see where fossils could have existed, all right? Or where we think they might be found. Another cool thing that we can do new technology-wise is paleontologists have started using CT scanners. So the same type of stuff, if you're sick, if there's something wrong with your body and you need to go to the doctor, you might go get a CT scan. We use those for fossils now to see what the inside of fossils might have looked like. For example, did echinoderms have stomachs? Maybe we can find out by putting them in a CT scanner. How cool is that? That's super cool. Um, so we have here a 14 year old who wants to pursue a career in this field. Where do you think they should start? So the first thing to start is by reading online. So I help run a blog or I'm, I'm one of the main contributors on a blog called timescavengers.blog. And it's run by a whole bunch of different paleontologists who super love talking to people who like science. And we write about new finds. We write about what it's like to be a paleontologist, all kinds of stuff. So look online for resources and watch videos, see where your heart might lead you. So for me, when I found those dinosaurs, I was just like, okay, this is cool, but I really like finding these little itty bitty invertebrate fossils instead. And my heart was just like, I'm just really not interested in the dinosaurs. You know, I still love them, don't get me wrong, okay? But um, see where your heart will lead you. What makes you really excited to learn more? And then you can start to figure out from there where we might wanna go and reach out to a paleontologist. So you can reach out to me on Twitter if you want. Uh, and I would talk to you. I do it all the time. It's great. I love it. Awesome. What's the biggest fossil you've ever found? The biggest fossil? Hmm. So most of my fossils are pretty small. So I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but probably that big. So they're not huge, right? And the Triceratops rib that I found was only like that big anyway. It was only a piece of one. So they're usually not that big. Cool. Um, okay, we've got five minutes left. So okay. if you have any really burning questions, please ask. Um, how do you transport your fossils? So um, toilet paper, a lot of the times, which now I understand is a little bit of a rare commodity, but uh, <laughs> we use toilet paper a lot to wrap our fossils carefully. And then we use um, film canisters so kids, I'm gonna spin you a yarn here. A long, long time ago, in a land not so far away, we used to have these things called film canisters uh, that we would use to put camera film in them. I'm joking, hopefully you all know what that is. Um, but they're really good, they're round and they have a plastic lid and they work extremely well for carrying delicate fossils. Now, this is where it gets fun. If you are getting a dinosaur skeleton out or any large animal, what you're gonna do is you're gonna cover it in plaster of Paris. So you know the stuff you made art projects out of in like elementary school? So what you do is you take this massive rock filled with dinosaur bones, okay? And you just wrap it up in this plaster cast so nothing can escape the rock. Now then you have a rock that's the size of like four or five people, which weighs thousands of pounds. And if you're looking at me saying, okay, I don't think you can pick up a thousand pounds, you are absolutely correct, I cannot. So what you do is you take a whole bunch of people, you flip that rock very carefully onto a tarp, so a big plastic thing, and then you drag it as much as you can to a truck. And then you really hope with every fiber of your being, you don't break any tires on your truck and you get that fossil 
where it needs to go to a museum. Once we get to that museum, we break the cast open and we actually pull the little bits of rock out, or the, excuse me, the little bits of bone out and someone actually puts it together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Awesome. Um, mm -hmm. When a bone is fossilized, what happens to the bone marrow? It usually doesn't exist, uh, doesn't stay. Sometimes there have been some, some uh, scientists who have said they have found things like uh, red blood cells fossilized, but we haven't been able to test that again to see if that is accurate. It could be, we just don't know yet. But bone marrow is soft. It doesn't uh, fossilize. So over time it decays. So we usually don't find it in fossils. That's a great question. So uh, some of our folks here have heard about fossil fuels. Uh, mm -hmm. Do fossil fuels and fossils actually have anything to do with each other? So this is a really great question because we there's a lot of cartoons out there about dinosaurs being made out of oil and or uh, excuse me oil being made out of dinosaurs and that's not true. So fossil fuels are made from fossils, but they're fossils that are itty bitty little microorganisms that lived in the ocean. So they're so small you couldn't see them with your uh, naked eye. You would need a telescope or not telescope. Oh my goodness, a microscope to see them. So those are gonna be things that make up our fossil fuels. Coal is made out of plant material. So coal is made up out of trees and vegetation that found, lived on land. So, but things like oil, that's all gonna be ocean critters that were so itty bitty, um, you can't see them without a microscope. Great awesome. question. Okay, so it is 12.43. We try to wrap these up at 45 minutes. So before we go, I have one last question for you. Okay. Um, well, technically two questions. One okay. is, uh, what is one thing that you wish everyone in the world knew about uh, your expertise field? And then what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about anything at all? Okay. Oh, goodness. Okay, these are great questions. Um, so the one thing that I wish everybody knew about paleontology is we can use the past to understand the future. So what I mean by that is when the world got really, really, really warm uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, so the oceans were over 90 degrees or about 40 degrees Celsius for those of you watching from outside the United States, it was so warm, a lot of things died. A lot of things went extinct. And when it got really cold, we could see the same patterns happening. So today, when Earth is getting really warm, we can actually look at the fossil record from hundreds of millions of years ago to understand what we might be able to do to help organisms and animal, animals and plants actually survive climate change. So we can use the past to maybe understand our future. And that's really important for us to understand. So I hope all of you know that uh, when you think about paleontology. So. Now, the second question was, what do I think everybody should know? Everybody should know about anything. Oh, everybody should know about anything. Okay. Oh my gosh. I'm usually full of weird animal facts. Ugh, and now nothing is coming to me. Um, so one thing that I think everybody should know is that science is incredibly important for every single one of you watching. Some of you might not love science. Some of you, hopefully you love it if you're watching this. But if your mom was like, you're going to watch this to get some education today, even if you don't like science, I'm going to tell you, you should care because your decisions reflect or they, uh, they affect everybody. So whether or not you choose to recycle, whether or not you choose to use a gas powered lawnmower over a manual one, those actually affect the world around you, right? Because you're using uh, limited resources like fossil fuels. You're using, um, you know, you may or may not be recycling and adding to a landfill problem. So all of these affect everybody. So you need to understand even just a little bit about science to be a good citizen of this earth. So even if you don't love it, which I hope you do, and if you don't love it yet, I'll do my best to convince you otherwise, um, it still matters to your life. Awesome. So thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Do you have anywhere that we can follow you on social media? Yes. So you can follow me on Twitter at Sarah L. Sheffield. Awesome. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been so awesome and educational. I loved it. Um, so if you want to follow our, uh, our series, you can follow us at Skype Scientist on Twitter. You can follow us at Skype a Scientist on Instagram. Um, and you can check out our website with all of our uh, links to future sort of episodes at SkypeAScientist.com. 
Again, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, which for kids out there basically means that your parents can write off uh, on their taxes that they donated to us. We're not just, uh, we're like legit effectively. Uh, we do a lot of work to help connect people with science. And so if you can help support our effort, it will be super appreciated uh, during these times. It's getting a little bit more expensive to host these sessions because we maxed out again uh, in our Zoom sessions. So uh, you can donate at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist. Even a dollar a month is really helpful. And uh, you can also donate one time at uh, paypal.me me slash Skype a scientist. We would so appreciate any help you can give us uh, during these trying times. Um, thanks again for joining us and thank you Erin for uh, you. signing. We just appreciate you so much. So uh, all right, we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.